Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out. Uh, I'm sorry, this um, sounds like some exciting uh, presentations earlier. I just got in from Binghamton. My name is Tom Wilbur. Uh, I'll be the moderator for the uh, this afternoon's panel. I'm the journalist and author who has covered shale gas development, and you can see my work on my blog, Shale Gas Review, and uh, in my book recently published by Cornell University Press, Under the Surface, Fracking Fortunes and the Fate of the Marcellus Shale. I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists, this afternoon's panelists. Uh, we have to my right uh, Stephen Barshoff with Sive, Padgett, and uh, Rizal. We have uh, Tom West, uh, the West Law Firm, and Helen Schlachi, Community Environment. Uh, Environmental Defense Council. Now, uh, we're very fortunate that uh, these attorneys, I am not an attorney, by the way, um, all our panelists are, and we're very fortunate that these attorneys uh, have been on the front line of the home rule debate as it pertains to shale gas development. And uh, the outcome of that debate, of course, will be very important in the way the industry uh, develops in New York State. And um, I, you can expect to see some of the arguments here uh, in, uh, as far as the influence of uh, home rule and the rights uh, that are affected by the home rule debate um, as it will be played out in courts in, in months to come. Now for the format, uh, I'll ask each of the panelists uh, to briefly uh, state their um, who they represent and their clients' stake in the uh, in, in the debate, um, and then each one of the panelists will give a presentation outlining uh, outlining their presentations or uh, their uh, their arguments, and uh, we'll have questions and answers after that. I ask that you hold your uh, questions and answers or questions until after all the panelists are through. So with that, we'll begin. Uh, if you've drawn straws, or uh, I'm not sure the order here. Uh, how we, uh, I guess uh, Stephen is going to go first, right? Okay. Okay. So uh, Stephen. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here. Uh, first, a little bit about me, so you understand how I come to this. I am a land use, local government law, and environmental lawyer. Uh, and I have practiced law both in New York as well as in New Mexico. I lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico for eight years, 1980 to 88. Uh, during that time, and even when I came back to New York, I was the principal counsel for the New Mexico Municipal League. Uh, that's the equivalent of a combination of the Conference of Mayors and the Association of Towns in New York. And in that capacity, I was out there when New Mexico first started to really boom in the 1980s. I also am familiar with oil and gas development, uh, having seen a fair amount of that out there, and the impact that that has on local government, and I had to deal with boom and bust issues, and there was a period of time over about six or seven years where if there was any land use case of significance, uh, I was involved in the litigation of that case before the New Mexico courts. Uh, coming back to New York, I have practiced law both uh, upstate, downstate, uh, east side, west side, uh, all around the state. Uh, and uh, you may, uh, please don't be fooled by the address on Park Avenue. Uh, I fully understand the difference between uh, downstate and upstate. Um, I went to Colgate, so I certainly know uh, the Shenango Valley. Upstate to Westchester. Yeah, upstate is Westchester, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, so with that very quick introduction in mind, um, let me tell you where I come out uh, for this uh, purposes of this presentation is neither pro nor anti-fracking. That's not what I'm here to discuss. I am here to discuss with you powers of local government. Use them as you will, okay? You make the policy decisions. The question is, what are the powers that you have? And I want to, I'm going to do this fairly quickly. This is not going to be a PowerPoint, because I want you to look in my eyes, and I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying, okay? I don't need tools to get this across to you. We're going to do this systemically. And we're going to look at the system of what is out there, what are the questions that are open, that are not yet answered, 
What are the ones that are starting to be answered? And how much can you know today? And how much are you going to need to wait to hear from others about what you can do ultimately? And then we're going to fit into that relatively quickly what your local government powers are. All right? So first, let's start by putting this into context. Uh, everybody asks the question of can units of local government exercise their zoning powers in order to either allow or ban uh, hydrofracking? The answer that the courts have given is not a final answer because the decisions that have been rendered by the trial courts that uphold municipal zoning powers to allow a municipality to prohibit hydrofracking are up on appeal. And Tom has been involved in that litigation. He'll speak about that more fully. But the answer that any fair observer would have to give is, there are two lower court decisions that uphold that power, but they're on appeal, so we don't know what the appellate division is going to say. We don't know if the matter will come before the court of appeals. We also don't know whether or not there will be legislation that may come down the pipe that might change whatever these court decisions are. As of now, no such legislation has been passed. So, the state of the law right now, if you simply want to be guided by the lower court decisions, is that there is land use control powers that units of local government have not to regulate hydrofracking, but to uh, use local government land use powers to regulate uh, extraction of minerals, extraction of oil and gas. And the more that you do this in a generic way, across the board governing all resource re extraction, the higher likelihood there will be that whatever local law you pass under your zoning powers will be sustained. Okay? Let me say that again. All right? If you regulate extraction of oil, gas, minerals, and so forth, including that heavy industry as well, the more that your regulations are across the board and not singling out hydrofracking, the greater likelihood it is that those regulations will be sustained. At the other end of the spectrum, the closer that you get to actually regulating the practices of hydrofracking, the greater likelihood is that you're going to step on the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's toes and run afoul of the state laws that vest the state with the power to regulate how hydrofracking is actually to occur. Where is the bright line between those two? There is no bright line between those two. There's going to be uh, cases, no doubt, that will go up through the courts, not so much based upon the ban of hydrofracking, but based on the regulation of the land use elements associated with hydrofracking, and the courts will decide if the industry litigates those cases and local government enacts them, where the balance is and how it is to be struck. All right, so that's one piece, the very basic land use and zoning powers that, uh, uh, that you have. And we're going to get into this in greater detail. The next piece, and I know you had discussions this morning about the environmental review, and the question is, how do local governments fit into the state's review process? Right now, again, we can't know with certainty. Why? Because the state hasn't adopted final regulations. What do the draft regulations say? The draft regulations assume that there is a very, very narrow band of authority for local governments to act, essentially to enact road uh, agreements and to uh, regulate the use of roads. However, those draft regulations were promulgated before the court decisions were rendered that upheld municipal zoning powers in relation to hydrofracking. So I don't know, and nobody knows yet, what the final regulations will say. What we do know, and what I think is highly likely to be the case, is that built into the state's environmental review process will be an examination of local plans in respect of hydrofracking. Specifically, what do I mean? The state has undertaken now a generic environmental review of hydrofracking across New York State. But the door has been left open in the future to a site-specific environmental review in respect of particular applications for a set of wells or uh, hydrofracking activity in a particular locality. One of the things 
that will be uh, a factor that the state will look at in determining whether or not there needs to be a site-specific review is whether the proposed hydrofracking is in a location that is consistent with or inconsistent with a local municipality's land use plans, its comprehensive plan. All right? If it is inconsistent with the plan, then if the, as the regulations stand now, there is a greater likelihood, not a mandate, but a greater likelihood that there will be a closer environmental review. There certainly will be a more elaborate environmental assessment that has to be filed with the New York State DEC. Okay? Now, what does that mean for local government action? And I'm going to start to merge the two concepts. If the state statutes, uh, if the state uh, holding, if the holdings of the courts follow the way they have been handed down, and the state regulations stay as they have been drafted, they point toward not only the desirability, but virtually the certainty or necessity of having an update to your comprehensive plan that addresses these issues. And that is the fundamental place of beginning. Why? Two reasons. One, it's going to potentially affect the state's environmental review process. And note, I am not talking about prohibiting or encouraging. I don't care what your plan says. You can say whatever it is that you want it to say in this context. The question is if you want to have a voice and you want to have that voice heard, then the first place to have it heard is in your comprehensive plan and how it will then play into the state's review process. Secondly, if you want your land use law, assuming you're going to adopt one of some sort or another, to have the greatest presumption of validity, then you're also going to amend your comprehensive plan. Why? Because a zoning law is, has a, the greatest presumption of validity when it is adopted in accordance with a comprehensive plan. Straight boilerplate zoning law, nothing sexy or hydrofracking related. But it is of critical importance to bear that concept in mind. <coughs> so if you are going to regulate at all, and if you hope to have any effect on the state process, your comprehensive plan is your first focus. Are we clear on that and clear on this as to why? Nod your heads yes or no. Yes or no. Yes or no. All right. I'm sure you're with me. All right. Now, now let's take it a step further. Regulate what? You, now you, you decided that you want to have some voice at the local level about hydrofracking. Let's put the banning aside for the moment. The only reason why I say that is because we can begin and end that discussion quite quickly. If you ban it, you ban it. Okay? Now, if you're not going to ban it and you're going to regulate the location or other aspects of hydrofracking within whatever the defined area of your land use powers are, you're of course going to start with your comprehensive plan and then go where? Well, you're going to start by, with the fundamental power that nobody disputes is vested within local government. And that's the power to regulate the usage of your roads. Okay? Vehicle and traffic law, state statute gives you the power to do that. The state regs that the DEC has proffered also acknowledge that. Indeed, the state has gone so far in their draft regs to practically beg units of local government to enter into land usage agreements, or road usage agreements, with uh, hydrofracking companies. Okay? And there's a good reason for that, because an agreement between local government and the affected business is going to be a lot better than fighting about it. If you, as a local government, make the policy decision, here I am going to be an advocate, if you're going to make the policy decision to allow hydrofracking in your municipality, then don't be schizophrenic about it. Don't allow it and then make the regulation so ridiculous that the cure becomes inconsistent with, or the, the regulations become inconsistent with your policy. Have the guts to stand up and make your regulations consistent with whatever policy determination it is that you make. And it, it'll be better for you, better for the industry if you're going to encourage it, and better, in fact, for the opposition because they'll at least know where you stand. All right? Now, when you talk about regulation of roads, there are a couple of basic elements. One, haul routes. Two, minimum weight requirements. 
Those are the basic ones that are there. You can start to go beyond that into agreements with, a, with business where there might be performance bonds that could be required. Uh, there could also be obligations to remediate uh, uh, damage to roadways should they occur. These are things that can be negotiated. When you move beyond regulation of roads, you're now, the, the further that you get closer to regulation of hydrofracking itself, the more dangerous it is that you're going to get. So the sliding scale in terms of making sure that you operate legally as you move away from regulation of roads, attempt if you can to make sure that your regulations don't just apply to hydrofracking. If you're going to regulate noise, if you're going to regulate odors, if you're going to regulate dust control, if you're going to regulate light, hours of operation. These are all legitimate objects of local government land use laws and will have a greater likelihood of being sustained if they apply across the board to all types of heavy industry, okay? Or at least extractive industries. Very important that you bear that in mind. And there's reasons for that. Because if an activity occurs on property, it doesn't matter whether or not it's hydrofracking or some other type of activity, if we're talking about noise, if we're talking about dust, if we're talking about light, hours of operation, and so forth. These are basic land use issues that are irrelevant to whether or not somebody is drilling horizontally or not. So my next admonition is, this is what I mean by schizophrenic regulation. Your regulation, if you're really regulating noise, regulate noise. Meaning, it's a standard of conduct that it doesn't matter what type of industrial activity somebody is undertaking, there should be appropriate noise limits. Why should the noise limits change if it's hydrofracking or something else? Okay? So the entire complex of, of uh, substantive regulations, you could call it your police powers, these need to be addressed but viewed through the lens of a, a, a generalized standard, not something that's there to penalize uh, the hydrofracking industry, or I believe you will, much, uh, you will run a much greater risk of having it struck down. Next set of regulations. There are going to be um, uh, boom and bust uh, type patterns of development in many communities, particularly those that are in areas that will see a large influx of employees of companies, drilling and associated work. If that is going to occur, there will be issues about housing, schooling, impact on housing prices, rental prices will go through the roof if there isn't an adequate supply of housing. These are issues that ought to be dealt with cooperatively with industry. How do you do that? We'll find out how many people are expected to come in. What are the number of leases? How many wells are expected to be drilled? In what period of time? What are the projections for the number of employees? And what type of housing do you think is the ideal type of housing? Is it mobile homes? Are you going to cause, is your community going to go running, shrieking into the night if, God forbid, you actually propose temporary housing for five years or seven years for mobile homes rather than constructing the infrastructure for full site-built, stick-built homes? These are the kinds of questions that need to be asked and answered if you're going to deal with the kind of boom-bust cycle issues that can be associated with extracted mineral development. There also can be and should be some level of site plan review built into your local ordinance. Why? Because site plan review is a discretionary review. It is a discretionary review, and in this instance, it can be vested in every instance, but in this business in particular, you may want to have that site plan review vested in your town or village board, not necessarily delegated to the planning board or to a zoning board of appeals. And it can be retained by your governing body. It is a discretionary review in that it triggers SEEKER. It triggers the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Why is that significant? Because you've now become an involved agency in the SEEKER process, and you have the ability to make your own seeker findings. It is different from undertaking the environmental review itself, which will stay vested with the DEC as the lead agency. But as an involved agency, you still have a role. You will get the environmental assessment. 
you'll be able to comment on the environmental assessment. The site plan review will be listed as an action that has to be undertaken in the environmental assessment. DEC will take that into account. Are you beginning to see the system? Okay. The, the process of having your comprehensive plan take your position on hydrofracking, DEC is going to need to take that into account and also then recognize that you have a site plan review at the same time and you will have the ability to make secret findings at the end of that process. I know I'm going quickly, you may have questions about that, we can go with, into greater detail about that if you like. But what I'm pointing out to you is there are these main components of a local government law or set of laws that ought to be put in place if you're going to regulate hydrofracking. The last piece is you may want, well, two last pieces. One is you may also want to look at licensing of landmen or at least registering them, the folks that come out from the, from the businesses to discuss potential <coughs> leases in your communities. At a bare minimum, you ought to at least know who they are who's coming into your community and have them register so that if there are issues, at least you know who is representing what company. There also is the possibility of working out host agreements. And I want to talk a little bit about host agreements in this sense. There's a difference between what the law allows and what practicality yields. I represent a number of clients, business clients, developers, that will sit down and negotiate an agreement with a community that involves them paying funds or doing things that, strictly speaking, the municipality does not have the right to impose. But they volunteer to do it. Why? Because they're buying peace and certainty. They would much rather buy peace and certainty and know what their costs are and know that they have a cooperative relationship with local government rather than have a fight that's a long way, uh, that is just going to be a perennial battle. Um, so, be mindful of the fact that things in a host agreement, such as uh, requiring that there be various types of inspections and putting the cost of paying the inspectors on the business. These are the kinds of things that can be negotiated and discussed, and oftentimes business of any type will agree to it if they know that they have a cooperative partner in local government. There are people that are no doubt uh, morally, environmentally, ethically, and otherwise completely opposed to hydrofracking, then then, okay? If you're not, or community is not, and you want to see that development, then regulate the activity intelligently and within the bounds of what the law allows. That policy choice, that's why many of you who are elected officials have been elected into office. You have my sympathy and my understanding that when you go shopping on a Saturday morning, you're going to hear it from your constituents on both sides. Well, that's why you're elected to office. And I was saying this over lunch today. Please don't expect much sympathy from me um, for the role that you have to play as local government officials. Because if we want our national leaders to lead, then our local government leaders have to set the right example. That means you have to take on the right, the, 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 the tough issues. You have to deal with them intelligently. You have to get the right experts involved. You have to make good choices by analyzing things on the merits, dispassionately, intelligently, with focus for the best interests of your community, knowing that you will not satisfy everyone. Okay? Thank you. Could you turn over the off the overhead lights over yeah, the? Uh, yeah. Okay. While he's uh, regulating the lighting, I'll, I'll probably do the same thing Steve did, which is just give you a little bit of background on myself and how I got into the oil and gas industry or representing the oil and gas industry. First of all, I'm a graduate of Auburn Law School. I'm proud to be a graduate of the school. Um, I spent most of my career representing industry on environmental issues. And when we've had an active oil and gas industry in New York State, I've been involved with the industry. It goes back to the question uh, just before lunch on the Article 7 process at the public service 
uh, law. Uh, I was involved with the amendments to that to add in the provisions in Article 7 for dealing with gathering lines. Uh, more recently, New York State really got active in oil and gas issues at about the turn of the century. Uh, up until then, most of the oil and gas drilling in New York State had been shallow uh, gas well drilling in the western part of the state, a lot of sandstone development, the Medina sandstone, some Queenston development up in the Figure Lakes region, uh, but it was mostly shallow vertical well uh, construction and it wasn't very controversial. Um, the, the Trenton Black River play came along around the turn of the century. Um, and I know that sounds funny, doesn't it? Just just happened. It sounds like uh, it should be a long time ago. Oh, but uh, what, what happened is they, the geologists came to realize that we had significant potential in this state for developing this formation. It's, it's a very unique formation. It, it's, um, it's in dolomitized limestone, which is like a bunch of geodes put together. And there's a lot of gas under pressure, and it's got confining situations called robins that hold the gas in place. And so the wells are very deep. They're drilled 10 to 12,000 feet deep, and they have 4,000 foot uh, laterals, and they're stimulated with chemicals, mostly acids. But that was what was happening around the turn of the century. Now, what happened is because those wells were very prolific, one of the wells in New York State, and I think it was 2003 or three, 2004, was the largest producing natural gas well in the country for that year, um, that there was a lot of money at stake. And so we found that our compulsory integration laws, which uh, regulate how landowners participate in that process, were, were somewhat uh, antiquated and they hadn't really filled in how that was going to work. So we went through an overhaul <coughs> of the law in 2005. I was very actively involved with that overhaul of the environmental conservation law as it relates to well permitting, well spacing, and compulsory integration. Um, and, and so I represented uh, one of the industry participants in that process. Um, ironically, just to show you how new the shale development is, uh, even though we overhauled the law in 2005, we didn't think about drilling shale with horizontal wells. Shales were, were put into the spacing law as 40 acre vertical wells because at that point even though it was happening starting to happen down in the Barnett it was too new to realize it was going to come to New York so we didn't consider high volume hydraulic fracturing with long horizontal segments and multiple wells in a common well pad so we had to come back in 2008 and amend the law to uh, allow for that that's when uh, that's when controversy erupted, okay, when uh, the environmental community woke up and said they do not like hydraulic fracturing. Um, a number of people in this room were lobbying on that, and uh, we ultimately got the bill passed, but it came at a price. It came at a price that with the governor's approval message on July 23rd, 2008, uh, he said we're going to have to have an update to the generic environmental impact statement, which has led to the four-year process that's still going on today. So uh, in that process, uh, our firm has represented industry. We've been involved in drafting comments on behalf of the industry, uh, and we're also involved in a number of regulatory proceedings before the DEC dealing with the administration of the old law and the new law. So um, now let's talk about uh, municipal home rule, to ban or not to ban. That's my cover slide, but uh, actually I'm not going to answer that question. I mean, Steve has given you some suggested pointers on what to do, what not to do. Um, this is a great policy debate, whether municipalities should have this authority. It's not my role to decide that policy debate. It's my role as an advocate for our clients to argue what the law provides now, and I'm sure it won't come as a surprise to many people in this room. It's been our position that the municipalities do not have any authority to regulate not only the actual natural gas drilling activities, what people call the how of natural gas drilling, but also the where. In other words, you, you can't regulate through zoning or through a municipal ban of uh, natural gas drilling, and, and how do we get there? Okay. All right, first of all, let, let, me, let me tell you about the cases. Uh, we represent the operator in the Dryden case, and we're co-counsel for the landowner in the Middlefield case. Um, as Steve pointed out, both of those decisions at the lower court level have held that municipalities have the right to ban natural gas development entirely. 
as, as an industry lawyer and looking for test cases, we liked these cases because they were pure bans. Okay, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a question of uh, a municipality <coughs> following Steve's advice to say, well, just do this. If you get if you're at this end of the spectrum, you might get away with it. This was the this was the mother of all regulation. Thou shalt not uh, do it at all in our community. Okay, so so they made good test cases. And they also make good test cases because in one case we have an operator whose rights depend upon the, the oil and gas leases and the temporal rights that they acquire from a lease. And in the other case, we have a landowner who has correlative rights. How many people here know what correlative rights are? Good, that's good. Most people haven't even heard of it. The correlative rights are the rights of landowners to get together to have the resource developed and produced for the benefit of the group. And that's essentially what operators do for landowners. Uh, and so that case represents a landowner um, who wants her oil and gas rights developed. Um, we are very close to finalizing the briefs. Uh, we've got draft records. The attorneys for the other side, uh, our sides are commenting on those. Uh, we're anticipating filing the briefs and the records in the next several weeks. So obviously we, we're kind of neck deep in this issue right now. Uh, we're expecting there'll be several amicus uh, uh, filings in support of our position shortly after we file our briefs. Uh, there's usually about a 45 day time period for the respondents to file their briefs, so we're expecting that the municipalities will file their briefs probably around early December. We'll have a couple of weeks to file a re reply briefs, and then the case will get put on a term at the appellate division, probably the February term. Uh, they're usually pretty good about getting decisions out six to eight weeks thereafter, so uh, I'm predicting March, uh, maybe April. I'm picking my birthday, March 15th. That's, oh. that, that just makes it fun. So uh, that's uh, the Ides of March. The Ides of March. Was, it used to be tax day, too. Uh, so uh, I'm going the wrong way here. All right, so let's talk about municipal home rule for a minute. It's three simple words. Let me just, let me just say it. Municipal home rule. Now, if, you're, um, if you believe in the people who support the right of municipalities, to regulate this, you think those three words are the be all and end all of this debate. And that municipal home rule is such an organic authority that it trumps everything, including the right of the state or the federal government to preempt that. As a matter of fact, I want to say it one more time municipal home rule. I was kind of expecting Judge Gabrielli to come down and tell me I just didn't understand it and get out of this room and go away. But he's not, because the, the law, uh, as is set forth in this slide, is, is very. Uh, very well settled in this state that even though municipalities have great authority under the municipal home rule doctrine, uh, the state uh, has the right to preempt that authority. Okay, so we have the Albany Area Builders Association case and the quote there that it's a, it's a fundamental limitation on, uh, uh, on home rule powers. And I like this quote, the font of police powers of the state. The state is a greater authority. So if you look at what this means, um, it means that the state can preempt a municipality just like the federal government can preempt uh, the state. And the Wombat Realty is really a, a great case to understand the scope of preemption because that's the case that tested the Adirondack Park Agency Act. Okay, when the state came in and said, we have this jewel called the Adirondacks and the Adirondack Park, and we're going to create the APA and we're going to have state zoning, which is very unusual uh, in a land use context. And that was challenged. And it was found uh, that, yes, the state had the authority to do that, and they could actually uh, trump uh, local authority. Now, there's, there's a couple of different kinds of preemption, and, and this is true at the state level and at the federal level, although some people will argue that if, at the state level, if you have express preemption, you can't have implied preemption. We don't think that's the law. First of all, express preemption is the easiest way for a court to find preemption. If they find a statute says, Notwithstanding your municipal home rule law, you can't regulate this subject matter. That's something that the, we, the state, are going to regulate. The courts have to uh, enforce that. The other two types of preemption that you can have are conflict preemption and field preemption. So um, what is conflict preemption? Conflict preemption is if whatever you do at the municipal level conflicts with what they're doing at the state level. Now. Um, Steve gave a bunch of examples of things you can do 
I don't think you can really do many of these under the preemption analysis that we see flowing from the statute that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but um, one of the things you have to look for is, is where is their conflict? Well, for example, uh, everybody who's followed the SGEIS process and the draft regulations knows that the state has gone uh, way overboard, uh, some would say, in terms of regulating the wear of natural gas drilling. They've got, uh, we're not, they're prohibiting drilling in certain watersheds. They've like, got all kinds of prohibitions over different types of aquifers, setbacks for different types of structures and other things. And, and reasonable setbacks are okay, but they've, they've, they've made it so stringent that it's going to be difficult for the industry to come in and lay out spacing units, find a uh, well pad location that actually uh, fits into that scheme, and then uh, if the municipality comes in and says, you know, that's really good that you did that with the DEC, but our Euclidean planning tells us this should be over in the southwest corner of the town, uh, it, it, it basically can create a conflict. So um, let's let's just um, let, let's just talk about the mine land reclamation law. Why are we talking about that? I thought we were talking about the oil and gas law. The proponents uh, who say that, that municipalities have the authority to ban natural gas drilling, they say that uh, the oil and gas law is exactly like uh, the the supersedure or preemption provision that was decided by the Court of Appeals and crew run. And that, I think that was back in the, in the 80s, if I recall correctly. But essentially, you had a, a, a provision, and this is the provision right here uh, in front of you, that the Court of Appeals had to interpret as to whether or not uh, the municipality in that case could zone uh, mining activities and where they could occur. This wasn't a ban. This was a zoning attempt. And uh, one thing I want you to note in, in, in this uh, uh, statute, uh, and this is the whole statute, uh, and nothing but the statute, um, if, you, if you're a proponent of municipal home rule law, you'll only quote up to the first uh, uh, semicolon. Uh, however, I like to focus on the second part of the statute, provided, however, that nothing in this article shall be construed to prevent any local government from enacting local zoning ordinances or any other local laws which impose stricter mine land reclamation standards or requirements than those found herein. So the Court of Appeals was faced with that and, and a zoning by a, a municipality, and they said, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, municipalities have the right to zone because, in fact, that's what, the, that's what the statute says. And so the authority of the municipality to zone was upheld in that case. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through these next three slides just to tell you that the legislature came back after Fruman and made it even clearer that municipalities have the right to, to zone hard and soft rock mining activities. Um, and, and ultimately what happened is in the Granat Asphalt case, the Court of Appeals upheld a ban. Okay? But again, we started out with a law that invited zoning by its very terms. We then amended the law. To give, you, to give municipalities even greater authority to regulate uh, the subject matter and zone the subject matter. And that's why we got to a ban situation that was upheld by the courts. Now let's, let's go back to the oil and gas solution mining, uh, mining law. And, and, and let me go back and, and talk about the two cases. Both judges found, them, found this provision similar to the mining law provision that I quoted a few minutes ago. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Judge Serio went as far as saying that they're strikingly similar. Okay, so now let's, let's just read it. I, I don't have a lot of text for you today. I just bring, bring the law, and I think it's pretty clear on its face. Uh, the provisions of this article shall su supersede all local laws or ordinances <coughs> relating to the regulation of oil and gas solution mining industries. Well, first of all, that's different. It's talking about all local laws or ordinances. And uh, what kind of ordinances do municipalities enact? Dog control ordinances, yeah. Maybe uh, landman control ordinances, as Steve suggests. But the biggest ordinance that municipalities, the most common ordinance that municipalities enact are zoning ordinances. So we think uh, that, that that word is very significant. Um, and and, and the, the op opposition, our opponents, point to regulation. And they say that's a very limiting factor. That only limits the how, not the where. And that's what they point to. 
Uh, but then let's go on with the, with the statute. But shall not supersede local government jurisdiction. Again, that's not found in the mine land use law over local roads or the rights of local governments under real property tax law. So we think that the, you know, the plain English uh, reading of that is, is that you're done, you're out of it. No laws, no ordinances, except your jurisdiction, jurisdiction is a very important legal term of art, is limited to two subject matters, roads and taxation, okay? And if you look at this language in the context of the legislative history of this provision, it becomes very clear what was happening because what happened at the time was that municipalities had started regulating the oil and gas industry and the DEC was not very strong. They didn't have much staffing and, uh, and there, there was really no taxation system in place for the oil and gas industry. So at the same time that this law was adopted, what they did was they gave, they enacted a, a comprehensive ad valorem real property tax system that uh, gives all that revenue to the municipalities and the school districts. They also enacted a damages compensation system uh, for the municipalities, but the big enchilada, so to speak, was to give the communities the power of taxation. Now, um, I can tell you that there have been many projections about the tax revenue for the Marcellus Shale. One only has to go look at some of the Trenton Black River wells that were very prolific uh, over the last decade, and you'll see that where, where those drills were, were drilling episodes were successful, the municipalities and the school districts did very well. You could literally have school districts um, that would be you know, tax-free based upon the revenue they would, get, they would get from this system. We all expect that the state is going to tinker with that system. They're going to want to put a severance tax or something to get some state revenue. But you also have to understand that the taxation system that's in place now also includes uh, revenue based upon the production of the well. That's the way it's set up. So where that's going to come out, we don't know. But again, to go back to the simple statutory provision, we don't think that this statute is similar at all to the uh, mine land reclamation law pre for run. Here it is. I usually bring poster boards. I just didn't, didn't have time to go back to the office to get them. But uh, again, we think these are very dissimilar provisions. So. Um, here's the uh, program bill, um, and again, we, we argue with the proponents of home rule laws to what this means, but, but I, I think it, it's a very clear uh, legislative determination, or legislative support for the proposition that they have a comprehensive scheme in the state law, and, and that that authority had to be reserved to the state. And local government's diverse attempts to regulate the oil and gas industry serve to hamper those who seek to develop these resources and threaten the efficient development of these resources with statewide, statewide repercussions. Now, this was a 1981 statute. What happened in the 1970s? How many people remember waiting in gas lines back in the 70s and the energy crisis? Okay, well, we had just come through an energy crisis, and we were realizing that domestically we had to find as much, uh, as much domestic energy as we could. And so that's why you see this kind of language. Uh, you, see, you, see the line, you see other language that I'll get to in a minute. So it, it goes on to say, with adequate uh, staffing and funding, and they did come up with a funding mechanism, uh, that they'll be able to address these concerns and as assure the efficient and safe development of these in energy resources. So um, let's go back and, and look at some other uh, aspects of state law. Again, I'm just basically bringing you quotes from legislative history or state law. This is, the, this is the declared policy of New York State under existing law. This is nothing we're proposing. This is nothing the legislature is considering. It's already there. All right, so there's three things that, that the policy says. You have to prevent waste. All right, you have to um, provide for the operation and development of oil and gas properties in such manner that the greater ultimate recovery of gas may be had. And then you have to protect the correlative rights of owners. Now, this is not something unique to New York. This comes from the model oil and gas com uh, com commission um, uh, model. And it, it, it's very similar to what's in other states. But these three concepts of preventing waste, promoting the ultimate recovery, and protecting the correlative rights of landowners are certainly part of our policy. Uh, waste means, uh, and I think this definition is significant. Remember I said that the opponents say, uh, that this 
preemption provision only says that you can't regulate the how of drilling. You can't tell them what size drill rig or blowout preventer to use, but you can tell them where. Well, waste means the locating, spacing, uh, drilling, et cetera, which causes a reduction in the quantity of oil and gas re recoverable for a pool, from a pool under prudent and proper operations. So what does all that mean? Well, it tells us two things. It, location and spacing are where, not how. Okay, and if you look at, if you also look at the environmental conservation law, and part of the uh, part of the provisions that were in the law, and part of the provisions that we amended in 2005, we have very detailed requirements regarding statewide spacing for each type of unit for uh, large uh, multiple well pad uh, uh, shale wells. It's up to 640 acres with the pad approximately centered in the unit. So you, um, the, the government very directly does regulate the location <coughs> and spacing, i.e. the where. They tell you all your units have to abut each other or leave enough room for a new unit to be created. So we think that without even going outside of the four corners of the ECL, uh, we quickly get over the argument that, um, that the law does not regulate the where. Uh, and then you've got uh, the state energy uh, uh, policy, uh, which which talks about, and th this is a 1978 statute, which is what makes it fascinating, that it calls for the promotion and prudent development and wise use of all indigenous state energy resources, including natural gas development and natural gas from Devonian shale. Uh, the Marcellus and the Utica are Devonian shales. And here we had the legislature back in 1978, actually speaking to the promotion uh, of Devonian shale resources. I've actually gone back and researched that. There was a Department of Energy grant uh, to go out and look at, uh, look at uh, Devonian shales in New York. There were some wells drilled. Uh, I guess the geologists will tell you we've always known it's there. We've always known it had significant potential. But until the industry put together the concept of uh, of a long horizontal well with multi-stage hydraulic fracturing and hydraulic fracturing, we didn't have the secret of how to get it out of there. So, um, you know, that, that's the, the end of my presentation. Um, we think we'll be successful in the appellate courts. We think the appellate courts will not be as influenced by all the local controversy. Um, we expect that they'll, they'll be able to get through these arguments pretty quickly and see that there's nothing similar about the oil and gas solution mining law compared to what the Court of Appeals decided in through run with the mine land use law. And uh, we're optimistic that uh, that will send us on our way to the New York Court of Appeals. Thank you very much.